tonight is um, Carl uh, Lutuswab. I always have a hard time saying that, Carl. Canine uh, LA. Carl is a real expert on propagation, and we're delighted to have him back here. Uh, he always gives us a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and you know, Carl will be around to answer your questions after his presentation. But Carl, now whenever you're ready, uh, please go ahead. Okay, very good. Thanks, uh, Bob. And hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, yes, uh, there's a VE4 carry VE4 EA on here, Bob. So I'm sure he heard your comments about the rack uh, contest. So great. I don't know if there are any others in there. Yeah, there's uh, Bob VA3 ZZS. So uh, there might be some more in that list. Well, uh, I'm Carl K9LA in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're pretty far west, but we're still in the eastern uh, time zone. And uh, this is a great meeting because uh, some of the meetings I give are to the West Coast stations and clubs, and uh, those can get kind of late <laughs> for an old guy like me. Whatever. But what I'm going to talk about tonight is, uh, uh, let me get the share screen going here, about uh, propagation modes on, uh, on 160, <laughs> about six meters. Um, let me know when you see this. Let me get some other stuff out of the way here. Let me go to full screen. There we go. I'm full screen. So, uh, Bob, if you can let me know when you see it. It's there. Good. Good. Okay. Great. Modes of propagation on six meters. I had uh, a decision to make here. Should I talk about the interesting stuff that's going on right now or give a more general presentation on the many, many modes of propagation on uh, six meters? And I decided to do the many, many modes of propagation on six meters. Uh, I think Jim Kennedy, K6MIO, has written some uh, really good stuff on extreme long distance six meter QSOs. And at the end, I do have uh, a website where you can find his papers. So uh, I don't feel too bad, but if you'd like a follow up presentation on you know, uh, F2 and long distance F2 and ES and all that, I certainly can do that in the future. So uh, let's get started. There's a, there's a good old Heath Kit Sixer. Okay, I didn't advance, but that's okay. There we go, whoops, there we go. And here's some more, I thought I'd include some other vintage six meter rigs, the Gonzett six meter communicator, Heath Kit SB110. The Heathkit Shawnee. It looks like that one's been perhaps modified. It's got a, a toggle switch there uh, in the lower left that I don't think was in the original model. Uh, also the Heathkit Seneca. It also has a, uh, looks like somebody mounted the crystal socket right on the front, which probably isn't a bad idea when you, when you got crystal uh, when, when you want to use crystal control instead of digging inside the rig. If you've ever used one of these or the Sixer, I'd just love to hear your story. Uh, K9LA at AWRL.net will work fine. So what we're going to talk about is the fundamentals of the atmosphere and the ionosphere. It's going to be pretty short. Uh, a list of six meter modes. I think I caught them all, <laughs> or at least most of them. Uh, the major brunt of this presentation is a review of all these modes. It's got one slide on antenna considerations. I got two slides on cycle 25 status, and then uh, the references, which include, I think, a lot of good stuff on six meter propagation stuff. So let's get started with the uh, fundamentals of the atmosphere, the ionosphere. So how does 50 megahertz RF get back to Earth? Well, there's three ways. Either there could be refraction. That can happen in the atmosphere. That can happen in the ionosphere. Uh, one thing about the ionosphere, the amount of refraction is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So in other words, the higher the frequency, the less the wave is bent. And what that says is the higher frequencies need more 
uh, free electrons up in the ionosphere to get bent back to Earth. Uh, we can have reflection in the ionosphere. There's a conductivity associated with the electron density. Now, there's the formula. Uh, many, many electrons are needed for even poor conductivity at 50 megahertz. But I kind of think that could happen with sporadic E or even a major auroral event. Then there's scatter. Uh, it occurs in the atmosphere, it occurs in the ionosphere, and scatter implies more loss. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just a quick view of the uh, atmosphere and the ionosphere. You can see the uh, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere are divine, defined by major, mostly by temperature. Uh, the ionosphere is defined by uh, basically the uh, various layers. And you can see that uh, the ionosphere is mostly in the upper mesosphere and the thermosphere. The index, there's an index of refraction in the atmosphere. Uh, without any bending, the index is one and an increasing number increases the refraction. And the index of refraction in the atmosphere depends on pressure, temperature, and water vapor. Uh, there's also an index of refraction in the ionosphere. It again starts at one with no bending and a decreasing number increases the amount of refraction. Depends on the electron density. And the ionosphere has two indices of refraction. One is for the ordinary wave, one's for the extraordinary wave. At 50 megahertz, they're pretty much the same because they're quite far away from the electron gyro frequency down at uh, uh, you know, 1.5 megahertz or so. Now, uh, we have two indices of refraction in the ionosphere because the ionosphere is immersed in a magnetic field. It makes things uh, very interesting. Layers, uh, usually we think of refraction from only one layer, uh, but I think each layer could bend the RF a bit. And what's really important is the, the grazing angle on the highest layer. And there's a little sketch in the lower left. There's the angle of incidence on the ionosphere. The smaller that angle, the higher the MUF, the maximum usable frequency. There's a picture on the right there of uh, uh, where the troposphere is, way down there. Uh, uh, polar, mesospheric, polar mesosphere summer echoes, eh, around 85 kilometers. Then you got the, uh, the, the ES region and also the E region. That's about where meteors end up too. And of course, there's the F2 region. I just kind of showed it from 300 to 400, but uh, th there is a, a lesser and lesser F region until you hit the E region peak. And what I showed is this concept of each layer could bend the RF a bit. It's launched from Earth and uh, the PMSE could bend it a bit, uh, but not refract it all the way back to Earth. Uh, 7,000. Maybe the ES layer could refract a little bit more. And what that says is the F2 region doesn't necessarily have to be really, really, really high to refract it back to Earth. So I, I think some of this is, might be going on for some extremely long contacts. And we'll get into uh, the, the F2 region a little bit later. List of the six meter modes. Here it is. Every six meter mode you'd ever think about is right here on this one sheet of paper, right? Well, I don't know. Maybe I missed some, but I did divide them up into uh, uh, whether they had nothing to do with the atmosphere and the ionosphere, and then atmospheric, ionospheric, and then uh, Lance W7GJ will be glad to hear that uh, I've got moon bounce in there as extraterrestrial mode. <laughs> uh, the non-atmospheric and non-ionospheric modes are line of sight and ground wave. We'll take a quick look at that. Uh, the uh, uh, short path summer solstice propagation depends on the polar mesosphere summer echoes. And I kind of argued with myself, should I put that as an atmospheric phenomena or an ionospheric? And I ended up putting it in the atmosphere, uh, but it does have 
uh, a lot a high electron. It can have a high electron wow. density. So maybe it should be in the ionosphere, bah, whatever. Uh, a lot of ionospheric modes. And uh, as far as I know, just one extraterrestrial mode. Now, there's probably some more out there, I bet. So let's take a look at the uh, line of sight. That's pretty interesting. The, uh, the distance is dependent on the antenna heights. And there's an equation if the distance is in miles and the height is in feet. If you got two antennas at 40 feet, you're, uh, uh, you should be able to communicate about 20 miles. That includes atmospheric refraction, but it does not include obstructions to the horizon. So, you know, if, if you're, uh, uh, if you had a local six meter net, you should do pretty good. Ground wave. Normally you don't think a ground wave on six meters, but there's a uh, program from one of the uh, uh, organizations in the uh, ITU has a program called GR wave, stands for ground wave. And uh, if you go through the numbers for horizontal polarization, 100 watts, 14 dBi antennas at 40 feet, it looks like ground wave on six meters might be good out to 60 miles or so. Now, I don't know how believable uh, these uh, simulation results are, but all I can say is, you know, I can work uh, uh, Jerry, WB9Z, and Val uh, uh, over in uh, uh, Illinois on 10 meters via what I think is ground wave, and that's a little bit over 100 miles. So yeah, it's not inconceivable that 60 miles could be possible on 60. And uh, well, whatever, it's not really anything for working long distance, that's for sure. How about tropospheric scatter? Well, there's a nomogram for, nomogram for estimating the loss of tropospheric scatter. It comes from a 1957 QST article, and it's based on uh, uh, isotropic antennas. And it says how much loss is there between two, uh, two stations. Now, I'm not sure what, what tropic, tropospheric scatter uses. Does it use the MSK-144 or something else? Maybe someone can chime in later in the chat room. And what you can do is make a rough estimate of the receive signal power. Uh, it equals the transmit signal power in DBM the gain of the transmit antenna in DBI, the gain of the receive antenna in DBI, the loss from that nomogram over there. And also uh, I applied a, an advantage of MSK144 over CW of about seven dB. So example is a one kilowatt, 14 DBI antennas on both end. And that gives eh, somewhere around 250 miles. It's a minus 93 dBm. Uh, receive power, which eh, that's getting down there, but probably should be okay. Oop, what happened? Okay, there we go. Tropos yeah, that's right. Tropospheric ducking. Uh, that's an interesting subject. The typical inversion depth is around 200 meters. And there's a chart of what an inversion depth looked like. Inversion depth looks like from the AWRL UHF micro. Microwave experimental experimenter's manual in 1990. Uh, it, it also that that book also gives uh, inversion depths on 70 centimeters and higher frequencies, and I extrapolated the data down to six meters. Uh, and it looks like you need an inversion depth of around 450 kilometers per that plot on the lower right. That's quite big, but it could happen. I know that K7CW in Washington heard some long lasting openings that extended from Alaska to Southern California in the June VHF context in the early 70s. And he believes it was tropospheric ducting. It doesn't appear to happen uh, a lot, but maybe it gets uh, covered up by other modes that are available. There we go. Of course, the uh, Hepburn tropo maps give you a prediction of uh, tropospheric ducting. I have no idea how accurate these are. 
maybe someone can comment in the chat room later and we'll talk about it. But there's the URL that uh, uh, gives you those maps. And I should have mentioned, Bob, that I will send a, a PDF of this presentation to you. You can do whatever you want with it. So people can uh, look at those URLs and, and go to them. Okay, short path summer solstice propagation, SSSP. That was hypothesized by JE1BMJ in his article in Six News, uh, which is a magazine put out by the UK Six Meter Group. Um, original article was in a Japanese magazine and uh, uh, the UK Six Meter Group did a translation into English and put it in their uh, Six News. It's tied to polar mesospheric summer echoes, PMSE, and PSME is uh, radar, echoes, radar echoes between 80 and 90 kilometers in mid-May through mid-August in the Arctic. There are similar echoes down in the Antarctic. Uh, the peak PME uh, site, uh, PMESE height is slightly below the summer mesopause temperature minimum at around 88 kilometers, and, and it's above the noctilucent cloud layer. And my question is, uh, how do you tell the difference between PMSE and E sub S? There's the uh, probability of PMSE goes from about mid-May to mid-August, which kind of coincides with sporadic E. So how do you tell the difference? And I, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, of course, PMSE is for high latitude paths. So uh, you may be able to look at some ionosons at uh, the high latitudes and determine that, well, maybe ES wasn't that good, but maybe PMSE was. So, I think there can be some more investigation here. <clears throat> uh, what about the electron density of polar mesospheric summer echoes? Can it be high enough? Well, it sure can. Um, <clears throat> there's a paper that had some electron densities and they're shown on the right. Uh, it can be about one e to the 12th electrons per meter cubed. That's a critical frequency of approximately nine megahertz. And for low elevation angles, the M factor for a layer at 85 kilometers, uh, which is PMSE, is around six. So the MUF would be six times nine, 54 megahertz. That's not bad. Uh, now, you can see in the top picture, there's just one PMSE layer. In the middle picture, there's two layers. And in the bottom layers, there's three uh, PMSE layers. And it could be that, uh, you know, each one of those three layers refracts just a little bit. So it doesn't have to happen in one layer. And that kind of relates to the comments back on slide seven and bullet two. So some interesting stuff there. So PMAC sure can support six meters. <clears throat> About meteor scatter. Well, here's a list of major meteor showers from the American Meteor Society. Uh, you can see when the activity, activity period is. The column SL is the solar longitude. Zero is spring equinox, 90 is summer solstice, 180 is autumnal equinox, and 270 is winter solstice. R is the uh, brightness of the meteor shower. 2.0 is bright, 3.5 is faint. ZHR is the zenith hourly rate. You can see, uh, of course, the uh, carotids are very good, and so are the Perseids, and also the Geminids. The moon column is the age of the moon in days. Uh, zero is new, seven is the first quarter, 15 is a full moon, and 22 is the last quarter. And things are best when uh, uh, the moon is uh, uh, less than 10 or greater than 25 by that. Uh, by those numbers. <clears throat> aurora and auroral E. Uh, generally, aurora can occur when the K index is greater than or equal to five. Of course, there's a higher probability when the K is greater than five. Point shear antenna northish, northish and use CW. That's about all I'll say in aurora. Uh, auroral E, I, I wonder if that can happen. 
you know, we have aurora E on uh, 15 and 10 meters in the fall in the uh, late afternoon to Scandinavian countries, and I wonder if it could happen on six meters. Uh, aurora E is when the path is tangential to the auroral oval, and the, uh, the yellow line is the aurora uh, path, and the gold line is the auroral E path. <clears throat> Uh, again, I don't know if auroral E happens, but if it happens on 10 meters, there might be a possibility it can happen on six. Ionospheric scatter. Uh, slide five said that scatter results in more loss. Our normal view of a, of a refraction is, on the, is shown in the left two images. Uh, when the operating, operating frequency is less than the MUF, uh, the uh, A picture, uh, then uh, the wave is refracted back to Earth. When the operating frequency is greater than the, M the MUF, we tend to think that the wave goes into space and there's no contact. But what can really happen, and it's, it's been observed and it's even, uh, uh, it's even in uh, uh, BOA cap predictions, is that uh, there can be some scatter, even though the MUF is not high enough, and it's called an above the MUF mode. Uh, of course, it has more loss though, so we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> E-hops, well, the MUF uh, is the M factor times the critical frequency of the E region, was, which is SO, FOE. <clears throat> Normally the E region M factor is a bit above five. And what that says is uh, FOE, the E region critical frequency needs to be around 10 megahertz for 50 megahertz refraction. And that's not too common. If anywhere it's at solar max and the equatorial ionosphere around local noon. So uh, <clears throat> it's kind of tough to have six meter QSOs via the normal E layer. Unless maybe you're, if you're down in the equatorial region at solar maximum. And that leads us into sporadic E. Uh, it's called sporadic E because we can't predict it. <laughs> we know the general pattern with respect to month and local time, and that's what that image on the right is. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't really know which days will be, will be good days and which way, days will be bad days. Uh, all we can say is summer is best. There's a small uh, uh, probability increase in December too. Then uh, it's a bimodal probability, late morning, early, late evening. And the bimodal probability can allow very long distance QSOs. We'll take a look at that here in a couple of slides. Here's that figure from the last slide just uh, in a different format the probabilities versus time of day for a June month. And you can see it's pretty obvious it's bimodal. So what we can do is kind of predict sporadic E uh, propagation. For example, John N0JK in Kansas worked JA5QVI in early June uh, back in, uh, I forgot the year, but it was a while ago. That's a 9,700 kilometer path. Now, what, you, what, what I did is I broke the path into five segments. In other words, each segment was just under 2,000 kilometers, which yeah, maybe that's uh, a wrong assumption, but it's interesting to work through it. And what I did is for each of the five segments, I used the probabilities on the previous slide for each segment versus its local time. And then I multiplied all the probabilities together and that's what that uh, Excel uh, plot looks like. Uh, the, the maximum probability is around uh, 01 UTC for Kansas to Japan. And N0JK worked him at uh, 2345 on June 4th in 2006. So uh, that was encouraging and it led me on to looking at uh, uh, some QSOs to Europe. So here's N4KZ in Kentucky. 
to CT3 in early June, June of 2006, that's 6,052 kilometers. I broke that into four segments. So that's about 1,500 kilometers per second, per segment. Again, I use the probabilities uh, and uh, local time for each of the four segments. And that's what it works out to. N4KZ did work, the CT3 at 2208. That's what that red arrow is. Uh, notice that it's, uh, it, it's bimodal also. And that was interesting. So at one of the uh, W9DXCC conventions a while back, I asked uh, some of the guys in the audience, uh, do they see uh, dual mode probability to Europe on six, mo six meters? And they said, yes, they do. So uh, this is kind of a crude way to predict, but yeah, maybe it uh, gives you an idea at least where you should uh, put most of your attention at what time. And of course, you can do it for uh, not just June, but you can do it for May, you can do it for uh, July, you can do it for August too, and see how it changes. And I finally did one for field day, W7 to W2, in other words, east coast to west coast, 3166 kilometers, broke it up into two segments. So that's uh, well, around uh, 15 to 1600 kilometers per second, and that's what it comes out to be. Again, it's bimodal, and that comes from the fact that the probability of uh, ES happening is bimodal. So look in the, uh, you know, around, uh, if you're on the East Coast or West Coast, look look around uh, 17, 18 UTC, and again, at, you know, 02 to 03 UTC. Okay, one of the things that's is interesting is, has sporadically changed over the years. And here's some very old data from, uh, from the late 50s. Uh, it shows uh, the occurrence probability of uh, sporadic E uh, throughout the world for May through August. So it lumps all the uh, good sporadic E months together. You can see there's a, a maximum over Japan highlighted in red. There's a maximum in uh, northern Canada, <laughs> and there's a maximum over North Africa, extreme southern Europe. Uh, and on the right, that's data from uh, a GPS, radio occultation, and it's for June through August, and it's in 2002. So that's 50, 52 years difference in time. You can see that the maximum sporadic E has shifted from Japan a little bit further west into Southeast Asia. You can see that North America mm, is kind of devoid of sporadic E. And unfortunately, the map doesn't cover Europe too good. So, so I can't say what happened, but it kind of looks like sporadic E maybe has changed over the years. Um, I don't know how good that early data is. You know, I'm sure there was a lot of <clears throat> interpolation, maybe extrapolation to generate that map. But when you think about it, you know, the Earth's magnetic field is changing. Not only are the poles moving, but the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the field is decreasing. Uh, there's also, <laughs> uh, you know, there's uh, trends in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, you know, uh, global warming at ground level, which translates to global cooling at the higher, you know, at the higher, uh, probably the ionospheric levels. So it could be that and sporadic E is changing its, its pattern. Maybe one of these days when we uh, under, fully understand sporadic E, we'll be able to understand if there really has been a change. Uh, lots of Lots of interesting stuff with sporadic E and weather in the troposphere. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the work by G3YLA and K1YOW. There's probably others out there. Uh, Jim, G3YLA, he's a retired BBC meteorologist. He generates a daily sporadic E prediction index. He calls it the EPI, and there's the URL for it. We'll look at that on the next slide. And Joe, K1YOW, has a pretty interesting article in CQ. 
and you can download that article from the HAM SCI uh, website. Uh, and both of them uh, tie tropospheric events into sporadic E. Kind of interesting. And here's uh, G3YLA's EPI, sporadic E prediction index versus dxmaps.com. This is for June 2nd of this year. At about the same time, 1000 UTC on the left and contacts between 0955 and uh, 1005 UTC. Yeah, generally it's, it's a pretty kind of decent correlation. It looks like the maximum probability for ES is uh, kind of between Greece and Turkey. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of where it is on DX maps. Uh, uh, it might be interesting to just watch this as uh, a sporadic E occurs throughout this season and, and see how good that is. Here's a images of sporadic E by latitude comes from uh, ionospheric radios by Kenneth Davies, 1990. Uh, on the top is the auroral zone. It's ES sporadic E is mostly a nighttime event. Uh, the middle plot is, uh, call it the high temperate zone, which is uh, mid latitudes. Uh, it's similar, similar to the probabilities on slide 21, which was that uh, uh, dual mode probability uh, picture. And there's lots of ES in the equatorial zone around local noon. So if you're trying to figure out a path, anything that crosses the equator around local noon, you ought to consider sporadic E. It, it might be playing a role there. It's really got some pretty high probabilities of occurring uh, uh, throughout the year <laughs> and around local noon time. Okay, F2 hops. Well, the MUF is just like the E layer, uh, is the M factor times the critical frequency, the uh, F2 region, which is FOF2. The F2 region M factor is a bit above three. And uh, again, that comes from the height of the uh, maximum electron density, I assumed 300 kilometers. And that's reasonable for the F2 region. Uh, so what that says is for 50 megahertz to refract, you need uh, FOF2 around 16 megahertz. So three times 16 is 48, but uh, it's a little bit above three. So that puts it right in the ballpark. And of course, in the Northern hemisphere, this can occur with a high sunspot number, which is probably around solar max in the fall and winter, in the late morning and afternoon. So it's very possible. Cycles 19, 21, and 22 were very good for F2 region propagation. Uh, other cycles have it at a lower probability. Even cycle 24 had some F2 during the second peak, although cycle 24 was a small cycle. So that says there is hope for cycle 25, even if it is similar to cycle 24, a small cycle. It may only be for a couple months, in the fall and winter around solar max, but it'll probably be there. So you got to be on a watch watch for it. And of course, uh, the digital modes offer uh, higher probabilities because of their advantage in signal to noise ratio over uh, CW and much greater advantage over sideband. Transequatorial propagation. Uh, that involves extremely long pass across the magnetic equator with no ground reflection. Uh, that image in the lower left shows a signature of transequatorial propagation. On either side of the magnetic equator, there are clumps of increased electron density, about 10 to 15 degrees from the magnetic equator. So a, a, a wave starting at zero uh, kilometers on the left goes up. It, it doesn't need to refract all the way back to Earth, just enough to get it to the clump on the other side of the magnetic equator and back down to uh, back down to Earth. It can be pretty long hops, five to six thousand kilometers. Uh, it's best in the equinox months. More sunspots surely help, and it seems to be best from late afternoon through early evening. Uh, there's been some interesting uh, uh, TEP uh, 
recently, uh, not too long ago, there was even some two meter tip. So eh, pretty interesting. That's uh, really getting some high electron densities. And the map on the right shows typical trans equatorial paths. Uh, of course, there's there are paths across the magnetic equator all around the earth, but there's just nobody <laughs> in a lot of those uh, situations. Uh, of course, the uh, you know, like the Caribbean down to deep, uh, deep LU, uh, the Caribbean over to uh, let's see, ZD8 was that arrow is where it ends on the right. Then there's, uh, you know, Southern Europe to uh, South Africa and uh, Japan down to Australia. Unfortunately, for most of us in the continental US, it requires a link to TEP, either an F2 hop or an ES hop. Uh, of course, right now, ES is probably the most likely, and I'm pretty sure it's happened. Okay, ducting and chordal hops. Now we're getting into why there could be some pretty extreme uh, long distance QSOs on six meters. Uh, there's a sketch of ducting. It's showing ducting between the E and the F2 layers. And of course, uh, what's advantageous is uh, there's no... Uh, uh, there's no ground reflection losses. Uh, there's minimal ionospheric absorption because you're above the absorbing region. Uh, and on the right is shown chordal hops. It's kind of like kind of like uh, transequatorial propagation, but it's uh, it doesn't rely on the E layer. It can be just uh, from the F2 layer, and I think it can probably happen. Uh, with ES, with sporadic E, and uh, maybe even the E region too. So, and and of course, it's it's kind of tough to discern <laughs> from regular hops. So, which one is uh, really working? Uh, perhaps the signal strength gives a clue as to which one's more prevalent. Uh, you can always dig into ray tracing. Uh, unfortunately, the model of the ionosphere is a monthly median model. It's kind of like the average over a month's time frame. So uh, if something was uh, interesting happening on a specific day, uh, it doesn't show up on our model. So uh, we're, we're kind of we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place for short-term events in the ionosphere. And uh, it's not only at HF, but also at six meters too. There can be combinations of E and F hops. And there's a picture, it goes up to the F layer at first and comes back down and then goes to the E layer. Again, it could be tough to discern uh, from a regular hop unless uh, an extremely in-depth analysis is done. Uh, if you have ionosan data, you might be able to figure it out. But usually uh, ionosans follows Murphy's law in that uh, the more you need an ionosan in a specific spot, the less probability that there's going to be one there. <laughs> and even if one's there, it may not have taken data. So uh, lots of effort to try and understand some of this stuff. Okay, we talked about that above the MUF mode before. Uh, slide 19 showed uh, we normally think of the, uh, the, the operating frequency needs to be below the MUF, but it can be above a bit. Uh, there are several equations uh, to determine how much loss there is for this scatter loss for above the MUF mode. Uh, for example, Wheeler says uh, there's 8 dB loss at 50 megahertz when the MUF is only 40 megahertz. That's pretty dug on low. <laughs> uh, ITU has a, an equation. It says there's 23 dB loss under the same uh, conditions. Then there's Gibson and Bradley, and they say it's 33 dB loss if you're operating at 50 megahertz and the MUF is only 40 megahertz. So I don't know which one's right. Maybe they're all right under whatever conditions they assumed. But uh, uh, that loss may not be as bad as one might think, because on 50 megahertz, there's minimal ionospheric absorption. And that's due to the fact that the amount of absorption is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So the higher in frequency, 
the less absorption there is, and that makes room for some loss from scatter to still be available. And I, I think this is a big factor in the advantage of the digital, digital modes on the higher bands. Pretty interesting stuff. And uh, like I said before, uh, VOA cap does include an above the MUF mode. <laughs> and uh, I tried extracting data from VOA cap and well, of course, it doesn't match either of the three equations there. So I don't know, it's probably another one. Well, come on, there we go, skewed pass. There's been some uh, reports of skewed pass recently. Uh, you know, most of the time RF follows a great circle path, a GCP. Uh, if it doesn't, what you have to look for is electron density gradients that knock the RF off of one great circle path and onto another one. Uh, this can happen in the F2 region, especially near the equator, which is the most robust portion of the ionosphere. It could probably happen because of E sub S. Uh, a good example, but, but it's on 10 meters, was the FT5 ZMD expedition uh, back in uh, 2014. There were reports of skewed paths on 10 meters. And there's a, there's a picture of uh, the world with the maximum usable frequencies. And also I have uh, the actual uh, uh, paths that the, uh, the, the stations reported. For example, there's a station in Florida, N4II to FT5. The short great circle path is to the Southeast, but you can see he worked them when his antenna was pointed a little bit North of East. Then there's AA7XT uh, out further west. His great, his great circle uh, short path is to the west, but there was nothing there. And you can see what, why that happens because if you can read the, the contour lines, the MUF was only around 11, 12 megahertz uh, you know, go, going to the uh, west out of him. So he pointed to the northeast to work FT5X, which was really uh, kind of interesting. And, and looking at their paths and where FT5ZM was probably headed, you can see that the Great Circle Pass intersect over Northern Africa. And of course that's near the equator, which means there's some pretty high electron densities and gradients in that area. And that's probably what enabled uh, the, the uh, skewed path. Now, if it can happen on 10 meters, it kind of says it could probably happen on six meters. And it's probably worth looking more and more into that. Six meter moon bounce, okay. Uh, a typical EME path loss on 50 megahertz is approximately 243 dB. Now we can make some very rough estimates for uh, CW. Uh, the power received would be equal to uh, 61.8 dBm, that's a kilowatt, plus a 20 dBi gain uh, transmit antenna, plus a 20 dBi gain receive antenna, minus that loss is minus 141 uh, dBm. So what's the minimum discernible signal on a rig with a, uh, with a good preamp ahead of it? Well, it's minus 174 plus uh, 500 Hertz bandwidth uh, reduces minus 174 or to, uh, to plus 27. Uh, the 500 Hertz is 27 dB ratio. And then uh, I assume the preamp with a 2 dB noise figure. And that says uh, the receivers maybe minimum noise, minimum discernible signals around minus 145 dBm, which means there's a 3.8 dB signal to noise ratio. Now, if you use JT65, it has about a 10 dB advantage over CW. And that puts the MDS down at minus 155. And that raises the signal to noise to 13.8 dB. So what that says is that's why smaller antennas are acceptable. Uh, the, the, the advantage of DT65 really makes it good. Uh, there's there's uh, Lance's webpage about EME on six meters. Uh, there's also an interesting PDF, uh, which it was a presentation uh, on uh, 
getting started in EME, and you can you know, download it from that URL. There we go, antenna considerations. Okay, here's some patterns for a three element six meter Yagi. Uh, at 20 feet, at 40 feet, at 60 feet, at 100 feet, you can see as the higher it goes, the more lobes you have. So there's more of a chance that the signal may fall into a null. <laughs> uh, W2BPV back in the, uh, in the 80s wrote a book in Tenny Yagi design. And he believed the best height for an HF Yagi was one and a half lambda. Uh, that translates to 30 feet on six meters. And I bet you a lot of people have uh, antennas around that range, you know, 30 to 40 feet. Uh, I believe a high antenna on six meters can be advantageous. So it would be helpful if you use a stack of six meter Yagis. Uh, you know, that energy at very low angles could take advantage of a higher MUF. Remember that uh, angle of incident on the uh, layer? The lower that angle is, the higher the MUF could be. So uh, I don't know if there's a uh, best height, but I kind of think it's if you only can put up one antenna, it's probably between 30 and 40 feet and you could uh, probably do a lot of good work with it. And of course, every once in a while, if you got a, a really high antenna, it may uh, help out quite a bit. Cycle 25 status. Here's a recorded history. Uh, cycle 24 was the smallest in our lifetimes and the fourth smallest in recorded history. You can see there were three periods of big solar cycles. And uh, there were two periods of small solar cycles, cycles five, six, seven, and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It looks like cycle 24 has put us into a third small period, a third period of small solar cycles. And that's the critical question. Will cycle 25 get us out of this third period of small cycles or will it continue to keep us in that third period of smaller cycles? All we can do is wait and see. Uh, data from cycles one through 24 show that a big cycle rises faster than a small cycle. So what we can do is look at the, uh, the rise time of cycle 25 and compare it to a small cycle, 24, and the biggest in recorded history, cycle 19. Uh, the blue shows the rise of cycle 19. Red shows the cycle of the rise of cycle 24. And the green is the 11 months of data so far that we have on cycle 25. It's rising a bit faster than cycle 24. Uh, so far, June has been very good for sunspots. Today was really good. I think it was in the 50s for sunspots. So, of course, sunspots are just a proxy for the true ionizing radiation of the F2 region, which is extreme ultraviolet. But uh, I'm sure the EUV was uh, quite high today, too. Let's see here. References. Here's a bunch of references. Uh, K5ND has a, a six meter ebook. Uh, I, I talked about K6MIO's papers. Uh, you can uh, look at them at uh, www.qsl.net and uh, WA3MEJ and articles and library and all that kind of stuff. Uh, WB2AMU's uh, VHF Propagation, a practical guide for radio am amateurs from CQ. The UK six meter group. Uh, EI7GL has an interesting blog about things that are happening on six meters. G0KYA, Radio Propagation Explained. He talks about VHF. Uh, that's an RSGB publication. The propagations of the propagation chapters of the ARRL handbook and the ARRL antenna book are good. Of course, there are columns of the world above 50 megahertz, NGOJ, N0JK, and QST, VHF, US, UHF contesting column, and NCJ by John, and also VHF plus column by N4DTF and CQ magazine. And recently, G3XTT gave a presentation on uh, just general six meter stuff, and you can you can view it there. It was a pretty good uh, covered everything. <laughs> now I'm sure there are many more sources for six meter propagation. 
and the various modes, but uh, uh, hopefully this is a good start. So there are many modes on six meters. That's probably because uh, 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 E and F region propagation isn't as regular. So we had to look for more modes on six meters and we discovered a whole bunch of them. Some modes are easy. Some modes are more difficult. And of course, that's an understatement. If you're, uh, you know, like doing moon bouts or, or meteor scatter or something like that. But, you know, this, this kind of mirrors amateur radio in general. Uh, there are many different aspects of six meter propagation and it should keep you interested and busy getting on the band and trying to understand stuff. So that's all I had, Bob. Um, if there are any, I guess I can check in the chats and see what's going on. Well, Carl, that was a great, uh, great presentation. Uh, a lot of food for thought there, tremendous material. We'll be really happy to have this uh, video on our YouTube channel along with the, uh, the slides. We can append them to that. And uh, I just think oh. it's a great reference. And uh, it's a lot of food for thought there and, uh, you know, future presentations as well. So <laughs>